So we will call this meeting to order. This is a special meeting of the Yellow Springs Village Council. It is March 18th, um, and it is about uh, our water, our new water treatment plant, and specifically tonight to talk about uh, softening options, but I assume we'll get kind of a general overview of what's happening and what's happened so far. Um, I will make an editorial comment that I'm actually very disappointed to see so few people at a meeting that two years ago we were getting standing room only people about. So um, I hope the community is engaging because we're making um, a decision for the next 50 to 100 years. Um, so I would encourage the community to engage and get involved. Mm -hmm. Okay, now were you going to start? Um, did, Judy, did you want to call the roll? I'm sorry. <laughs> so quite I all keep right. doing that. Wintrow? I am here, obviously. <laughs> Sims. I'm here. House. Here. McQueen. Here. Lori Askins is out of town this evening. Also present is Assistant Village Manager John Young and Village Manager Patty Bates, who will introduce her crew. Um, also present is Joe Bates, our uh, water superintendent, and uh, Brad Alt, one of our water operators, as well as Johnny Burns, who oversees the water distribution system. Um, and I would like to introduce uh, <laughs> Sam Swanson and Lindsay Hasnauer from uh, HNTV. Sam? Thank you, Patty. Um, but I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be able to give you an overview of some of the aspects that we've looked at uh, through this planning period of the water treatment plan. Uh, specifically, we are going to look at softening tonight. Did I do that? I, oh, I don't think so. All right. And so uh, what we'll do is really look at the specifics related to water softening. We'll look at the technologies that are applicable to the type of groundwater that you have here in Yellow Springs. We'll describe the way we investigated it as engineers and then we discussed it as a group and the cross-section of the group is that I'm one of three HNTB engineers that work with an ad hoc committee formed by four people from Yellow Springs operational staff, two people from their administrative staff and two people from the village council. So we had 11 individuals that had uh, worked on on this project and specifically uh, water softening. Then we'll open up the floor to listen to your comments and questions and, and have a uh, open discussion. All right, so what really is softening? It, it's really removing the hardness from the water. And hardness is a term that collectively is used to describe metals that are dissolved in the water, uh, various compounds, <coughs> and mainly uh, related to calcium, and magnesium. And regardless of uh, the, the levels that you have uh, of each constituent, they're commonly displayed uh, or described uh, in terms of calcium carbonate as CaCO3. So that's what we'll, we'll look at as we go through the ranges, the uh, levels that te softening technologies can do. So this is a uh, water hardness scale that is a, somewhat of a textbook type table. Uh, this one comes from the Water Research Institute. And it really defines soft water, moderately hard, hard. We'll, we'll just look at the numbers rather than trying to categorize what, what's hard or very hard, that, that aspect. Uh, just two things to point out uh, that you know in the uh, very hard range. Uh, you can go all the way up to 800 in some municipalities. Uh, here in Yellow Springs, we're a little bit less than that. But when we talk about softened water that's typically put out to a municipality, uh, it's typically in the 120 to 180 milligrams per liter SCAC uh, range. All right, as far as Yellow Springs water, uh, this data has been taken from Ohio EPA. Uh, they have an ambient groundwater quality registry. So that's where we got this. This is well too. And since uh, we use this for the analysis, uh, the other three wells that you use to withdraw your groundwater, we've sampled and they're, they're in this range. So uh, it varies from 275 to 553 milligrams per liter of CaCO3. 
Uh, the average of that sampling data was around 450. And it's broken really into two constituents. About two thirds of that hardness is a result of calcium carbonates and other non-carbonate compounds. And about a third of that is from magnesium hardness. And that, that's an important breakdown because some of the technologies that we've looked at remove calcium hardness, but not magnesium related hardness. And so your water is considered very hard on that, on that scale. In previous engineering reports have called it extremely hard. It's somewhere you know, in you know, the very high range. Again, I wanted to illustrate that when we talk about softened water that is done by a municipality and provided to the customers, we're usually in that 120 to 180 range. There are some municipalities that target 120. There are some, like your neighbor Springfield, that target 180. The important aspect is that you may target a number, but it's always a range. Uh, you, uh, from day to day to day, you may have 50 milligrams per liter of hardness difference from the same wells. So uh, the technology is set up that softened water that will be provided to a municipality from, say, your new water treatment plant would be within a certain range. All right, uh, you know, why do municipalities soften? If we talk to a cross-section of our clients who soften their water or individuals who soften their water, the main thing is they want to reduce the potential for scaling. Any moving item, whether it be a meter, whether it be a valve, uh, has the potential to scale with hard water. Uh, even your pipes, but it really doesn't affect pipes uh, unless they're very small, would you actually have a significant reduction, unless it's maybe 100 years. As far as uh, you know, some of the more subjective items, people like to soften their water because they feel they get more effective use out of their soap and detergent. Some people don't like the feel of hardness. Uh, so you know, either from a homeowner standpoint or municipal standpoint, the chief reason that you hear is that there is a, uh, a longer life from the equipment. Uh, you have reduced maintenance because of scaling. The other result is that if you have municipally softened water, people will stop using their home softening units. All right, when we were looking at the practical applications for Yellow Springs groundwater, we looked at four types of technologies. Uh, they vary widely in how they accomplish removing the hardness from the water. Uh, nanofiltration is a physical process where you're actually filtering the calcium and magnesium ions from the water. Lime addition is adding chemicals to form a precipitate and pulling down the hardness into a sludge. Ion exchange is taking other metals and exchanging them for those calcium and magnesium metals. And then pellet softening is conditioning the water and actually forming a scale on the silica sand that you're using to remove the hardness. Uh, there's a couple of different ways that we can ion exchange and we'll cover both of those. So each of these technologies we'll go through, highlight the advantages, disadvantages, practical applications for Yellow Springs, and then relative costs from both a capital standpoint and an operational standpoint. All right, so nanofiltration. Um, some of you might have heard of reverse osmosis where you can take seawater and make potable water. Well, nanofiltration is the lower pressure cus uh, cousin of, of reverse osmosis. So what you have are pressure vessels on a skid and you have tightly wound synthetic membranes that at high pressure you pump the raw water through and it filters out all of the magnesium and calcium ions and any other deleterious materials such as pesticides, uh, herbicides, any organics. So it's very complete in what it removes from the water. So, Typically, because all of the hardness is removed, we'll bypass about 30% in an installation like this. So you'll remove the hardness from about 70% of the water and then blend it to get 
back together to get that 120 to 180 milligram per liter range. Now, this technology uh, uses uh, a good bit of water and it's constantly producing waste as you're producing the finished water. So that's why we say the recovery is only about 82%. And, and that's a terminology that we use. And the example I'll give is that if we apply 100 gallons of finished water to the nanofiltration softening unit, we'll produce 82 gallons or so of potable water. So there's about 18 gallons that are then dedicated to uh, waste and flushing. Uh, and it's a high strength waste high dissolved solids uh, because you've removed all of those materials from the water so we would have to take this wastewater then to the wastewater treatment plant rather than a direct discharge. <coughs> all right, lime addition. Uh, sometimes you hear this called lime soda ash softening and you take lime which is a calcium compound and there's a couple of different versions you can use in combination with soda ash, which is sodium <coughs> carbonate, and you're able then to pull down the bulk of the calcium and the bulk of the magnesium hardness. You can, with chemical addition, with lime and, and soda ash, you can remove to about 40 milligrams per liter of hardness. Much like nanofiltration, we do what we call split softening where about 70% of the flow would be softened and then the raw water would be blended to get that 120 to 180 milligram per liter range. Now, when you're adding um, soda ash to the lime, uh, you will increase the sodium of the water probably about 110 milligrams per liter. The aspect about using lime softening is that you're creating an environment much like softening itself, that you will scale out on your equipment that you use to treat uh, or soften the water. And then the other aspect is that when you put in lime and soda ash in hard water, you will pull down a precipitate, and that's what you see here in this tank. This is called a contact clarifier. And so the softened water will flow out, you'll decant that, and then in the bottom, you'll settle out the sludge, and that has to be disposed of regularly. Uh, for a plant the size of Yellow Springs, you may generate up to a 20 cubic yard dumpster a day for your high flow. So there's quite a bit of sludge to handle. And that's primarily the drawback uh, with this type, that you have a lot of, a lot of sludge. All right, ion exchange. Uh, that is commonly done in a series of pressure vessels. For the size of treatment plant that we're looking at for Yellow Springs, we use four of those vessels. Within uh, that tank, we have a resin that holds metal ions, and as the raw water comes in, then those metal ions uh, are released into the water, and the calcium and magnesium attach to that resin. And so after we soften a certain quantity of water, then that resin has to be regenerated. Now we call this conventional ion exchange because for many decades, this has been used throughout Ohio. And it's a sodium-based type ion exchange where you use a brine then to recharge that resin bed. And so you are adding between 130 to 150 milligrams per liter of sodium to the water if you use this type of ion exchange. Much like the two previous technologies, this is able then to take the uh, hardness down to zero. So we do a blended flow where we soften about 70% and reblend to get the product water in the normal softened range. Now, as far as the waste here, it's completely liquid-based, and it's a batch type, so that typically if you have four units, uh, you'll be softening the water with three, and then you'll re be recharging the fourth. So you recharge it with the brine, uh, then that spent wastewater then would be collected, and then because it's high strength and high solids, you would discharge it to your wastewater treatment plant 
for, for treatment. Now, <clears throat> this is the newer version of ion exchange. And again, from the exterior, it looks the same. The only thing that's different is really the type of resin that's in each of those tanks and the chemical that you use to revitalize or recharge that resin. In this case, a weak acid cation uh, would be hydrochloric acid. The advantage of this over using the sodium brine is that then you're exchanging hydrogen for the calcium and magnesium metals. So there's no net increase in sodium for this type of ion exchange. <coughs> Again, much like the previous ion exchanges that uh, you would blend, you would soften about 70% of the water and then blend with the about you know 30%. And you'd have to neutralize the liquid, meaning you'd have a very low pH, so you'd have to increase the pH, and then you'd send that to your wastewater treatment plant as well. And again, it's a batch, batch type system. And then the last technology we looked at is called pellet softening. And this technology, you would uh, essentially condition your water, uh, you'd increase the pH, probably using caustic, which is sodium hydroxide, and then you'd feed that water into the bottom of this tank. <coughs> this tank's about 18 feet tall, it's a conical shaped tank, and you'd flow the water up, and counter current to that, you'd drop silica sand, and as it <coughs> would uh, flow to the bottom, the calcium based hardness would scale onto that sand. And so periodically you would re remove the sand uh, along with just a little bit of water, uh, usually about 30 gallons. And the sand is probably about a, a cubic, 1.5 cubic feet for about every six hours of operation. So it has a very high recovery rate, probably the highest, and you would put your entire flow through this unit. There would not, not have to be any blending. Uh, the aspect that doesn't allow you to go into that 120 to 180 range is that pellet softening is only effective in calcium-based hardness removal. So what your ambient mag magnesium hardness would be, you would carry through. So that's why we have a, a projected range of 180 to 225 milligrams per liter as CaCO3 compared to the other four that do that more traditional softening range. Uh, and then as far as the sand, and we'll have a photograph of that in just a little bit, uh, it really can be dried out, the liquid returned, and then used for uh, a variety of purposes. All right, as part of our workshops during this planning period, we've generated a number of these type of curves where we've looked at the equipment cost versus the capacity of the plant. We tried to do trend lines uh, between uh, 1, 1.5, and 2 MGD, and that's million gallons per day of finished water produced. And we talked about the current capacity versus what a new plant's capacity would be. And we've really looked at a one MGD plant uh, so that you could produce one million gallons per day of potable water at your maximum flow rate. And that gives you some flexibility. Your current rates are about a third of that. Current demands are about a third of that. On peak days, they're, they're probably in the 600,000 gallon range. So a million gallon per day plant would allow you then some extra growth. And we feel that's a practical balance point. So we'll just look at those costs and comparing the technologies. The other aspect that I'd like to point out that would be a significant improvement over your existing plant is that we've looked at parallel redundancy so that if you do have a unit out for service or some other maintenance aspect, 
that you could always run half your plant, you could always produce 500,000 gallons from the plant so that you wouldn't be strained like you are now if there's a major mm -hmm. aspect. So from a redundancy standpoint, we looked at a minimum of two units for these capital costs. Mm -hmm. So two pellet softeners, the equipment cost for that would be $530,000. And again, we're looking at just the specific equipment for softening. For ion exchange, and that doesn't matter really if you use the resin that's sodium-based or acid-based, that cost would be 625,000, and those would be four ion exchange units, each with a capacity of 0.25 MGD or 250,000 gallons. The triangle, the blue triangle, are for two nanofiltration skids, and that sum was 640000 for the softening equipment. And then the purple dot was for two lime softening units, and those are the two contact clarifiers, the mixed tanks for two chemicals, because those chemicals come in dry and then need to be made into a slurry to be able to feed them into the contact clarifiers, and that's a total of 810,000 for just the equipment. So in order again, it goes pellet softening, ion exchange, nanofiltration, and lime softening as far as capital costs for just the softening equipment for a 1MGD treatment facility. We also looked at the operational costs relative to one another. And we broke that down really into three categories. Uh, the blue bars are the power, and that's mainly due to pumping. The red bars are the chemical usages for the chemical conditioning and the chemicals that were used in the softening process. And the green bars are the residuals disposal, some liquid, some solid. So as far as the power, uh, you know, nanofiltration is by far the most because you're, you're, you're uh, increasing the pressure through those filters, and so it requires quite a bit of power to be able to do that as compared to the other technologies where you're basically just lifting the water and then letting it flow through the system by gravity. Again, nanofiltration really leads the way in the amount of chemicals that are necessary to pre-treat and condition the water to make sure that you can filter at those high pressures. The difference between sodium-based and <coughs> acid-based ion exchange is about two to one. The acid is much more expensive than the sodium brine. Lime softening, again, it's really those conditioning chemicals that you use specifically for the softening, the lime product and the soda ash. And then pellet softening uh, is really the cost of sand and the cost of caustic you use to precondition the water. As far as residuals or waste management, the ion exchange and the nanofiltration are liquid wastes that we dispose of through your wastewater treatment plant. And so those costs are strictly the cost to pump to your collection system and then flow by gravity to your, uh, your wastewater plant. And so because these are batch systems, these costs are uh, about half the cost of nanofiltration because that's a continuous wastewater flow. The lime softening is really just the disposal of trucking the sludge to wherever that disposal point is, whether it's farmland or a landfill. We haven't included any tipping fee if it happened to be landfill disposal. We feel that you probably would, much like your wastewater sludge, be able to dispose of it in a agricultural sense. And then because the amount of sand that we produce in pellet softening is about a, a, a third of what the sludge projected is, uh, we have that as trucked as, as also, and there's, there's a lot of flexibility in how that could be disposed of. So uh, in general, ion exchange from a sodium based and pellet softening are roughly half the operational costs of the other three technologies. 
And I would like to say that these costs that you see here are for a one MGD plant. So your plant would have to be operating every day at its maximum capacity to generate these costs uh, right off the bat because you operate in about a third of that, they, they'd be reduced by you know, a factor of three. So I, wanna, I don't want someone to look and say, uh, you know, it'd be $100,000 just to operate this. It, it would really actually be the starting point of about a third. And this is really an order of magnitude cost estimate. So, so uh, after we discussed all of the options in our ad hoc group, uh, if the recommendation was that if we include softening in this new water treatment plant, that we felt pellet softening was really the <coughs> technology that would be most applicable. And for really a number of reasons, in addition to the fact that uh, from a cop capital and operating <coughs> cost standpoint, it, it's very competitive. Uh, it, it really is very flexible in its capacity it does limit the lower level in which you can soften, but it is significantly taking off the peaks of your very or extremely hard water, however you want to characterize it. The other aspect that is really appealing is that it has a very high recovery, meaning the water that you remove to the ground, you're transferring to your customers, and the waste product is uh, a slight bit of calcium coated sand. And by the way, that, that's not calcium, that's snow. I just want to point that out. Uh, so it's really indistinguishable. And, and the uses of sand are, are widely varied anywhere from using it as part of your winter road program with salting and sanding roads to any backfill needs you'd have. The nice thing about sand is it qualifies as structural backfill. So anywhere that you need fill, you can use the sand. Uh, and it does have a lime content to it, a liming type content, so it actually even could be used on agricultural lands as well. So anywhere that you really could apply uh, you know, a sludge, you could apply a sand as well. But it's much more versatile because you could use it actually as backfill for piping projects and, and really any other construction uh, project. So with that, uh, that covers really all the aspects uh, from start to finish of what we've done over the last six weeks or so regarding software. So we'll just open up the floor. Um, yes, I think that would be that would be fine. Um, Sam, I, I did want to say now the pellet softening, um, the 180 to the 225 is still considered very hard water, correct? Yeah, I mean, even the categories that you see from 120 to um, 180, mm -hmm. those textbook will say that that's hard water. Okay. And those other categories that where you see soft water, they're more industrial standards because industries need uh, quite a more soft water because when they have boilers and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. scaling is a huge factor for them. So, yes, it still is in the very hard range, but all municipalities soften between, almost all of them, I should say, I don't want to say all of them, but almost all of them soften it to that 120 to 180 range. And if you look at textbook definitions of that, they'll still call it as hard. Okay, so it would be considered softer water than we have, but not soft. Correct. Okay. So we could use the sand <laughs> you could use it as an aggregate, yeah. There's nothing that precludes you from using that as a construction material. Thinking ahead, Kent, thinking ahead. I, mean, I, I just want to, um, Jerry and I were the, the two council members who were involved on this committee, and I just wanted to be a little bit more explicit about um, the reasons that we thought the pellet softening was, was preferable. You know, we, we definitely heard from a lot of <coughs> citizens that um, they didn't want the added sodium in the water from ion from traditional ion softening. So we felt that this really satisfied that. I mean, there are some people that expressed a, a, that they didn't actually like the feel or or the idea of soft water. So the fact that it's not 
you know, being softened down to the level that, that more traditional softening methods are, I think is, again, I think will, will uh, be preferable to, to many citizens. Um, but we really feel that the, the scaling and the issues of equipment, we heard that time and time again from, from industrial users and from our business community and our citizens that you know, their water heaters don't last as long. So from that standpoint, we really felt as if we needed to deliver softer water than we have. And so we felt as if this was a good compromise. And, and you know, also the waste stream, that the waste stream is, is really, you know, actually potentially usable as opposed to potentially putting sodium in the waste stream. So, you know, th those are why, you know, what Jerry and I talked about and, and the rest of the folks talked about. I, I did want to underscore one thing. Your, your ambient sodium levels are at about 20 milligrams per liter. And because in pellet softening you have to condition with a, uh, a caustic compound, and typically the most cost effective is sodium hydroxide, that you will add a small amount of sodium. And I think we projected that uh, we could add as much as 43 milligrams per liter. So that would be around, uh, with your ambient background sodium, around 50 milligrams per liter, but certainly uh, about three times less than what ion exchange would add, and about you know, two times less than what lime softening, lime soda softening mm -hmm. would be. So I, I just wanted to make that point if I hadn't mentioned it. I was trying to go through in my mind, but pellet softening does add a slight amount okay. of okay. sodium. If we use the most cost effective uh, <coughs> pH chemical, which is sodium hydroxide. <coughs> One of the things that I understand in one of our problems with minerals in the water is manganese. Is, is this addressed? Is that a factor? Well, is that something we need? Th that would be a separate treatment. And when we looked at pretreatment options, what we feel best is that prior to softening, you would remove iron and manganese, and that would take away the brown and the blackish color of your current water. And we would do that through aeration, which you do now, mm -hmm. and then chemical oxidation, which we feel, because you need to chlorinate, we would use chlorine, and then we would contact that, and then uh, we would actually recommend that you pH adjust, and then you'll get complete removal of those two metals, because we'll have a detention <coughs> tank after those two oxidation steps. So. Your charts talked about power and chemical and uh, the disposal costs. Are labor costs a factor in differentiating? Well, um, that's one of the more difficult aspects to really um, quantify. So I really stuck to the power and the chemicals that I could calculate. Uh, you know, and this is, and Joe, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you have quite a, a wide range of skills from water and wastewater. When we talk through the specific technologies and you've gone on the tours, did you get an impression other than, I know that lime is very labor intensive, that type of softening, that <clears throat> ion exchange or pellet softening or nanofiltration would require you any additional efforts so that you felt you'd have to have additional staff? Um, I see that as a possibility. We're currently at three, including myself. <coughs> so, uh, you know, um, the line, especially, would definitely incur another employee. The other processes, it also depends on the extent of automation in the plant and the use of SCADA, which we haven't really talked about yet. Have we? No, we haven't gotten to that step, but it is relatively easy with modern technology and then modern communication devices to have, uh, you know, on demand what's happening at your treatment plant. None of these discharge direct to the receiving stream, so if you go through the current wastewater plant, does it require a special process, additional equipment, different operating methods or anything like that to handle the outflow? 
Yeah, the liquid based, uh, as long as we keep it within the range that's not going to affect your biomass, then we'll be fine. And most of these materials that are dissolved are inert. So because they're total dissolved solids, they're really just passed through. So it comes in, very little of it settles out in your sedimentation or clarification process, and it'll pass through. So um, that is correct. And so what we feel, though, is if you municipally soften, you will probably then get less people that actually operate their home softening unit. So the total dissolved solids will probably be in the same vicinity. Okay. I have a home softener. What's typically, what do they put out, 25 to 15 parts per million? Uh, and it's just a brine salt based, um, and you have no bypass. Yeah, you know, it's one of those things that uh, when you start out and the resin is fresh, uh, you're going to get very close to zero. And as you hit what we call breakthrough, and some of those resins, resin modules are filled, then you will gradually go up to the ambient level. So, it, it, you know, it's just a really a, a matter of how often. Uh, you have a setting where you have a timer that recharges automatically, so it's off, you know, that off. But probably on that low end, it's, it's actually very low. So that on our original table would be very soft water. So my wife will tell you I'm pretty oblivious, uh, but even I can tell when the softener needs to be recharged. Okay. So by the feel of the water. Yes. Okay. And I'm assuming she's going to want to continue. You end up at 200 parts per million, she's going to want to continue to soften. It just means we would do it less often. Less use salt. Less material. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. I, if we <coughs> cut the hardness in half, then yeah. Yeah, theoretically you should have to you know, soften half. And, it, and it's our understanding when we, even when we went to Springfield where they have lime softening, that they said that they have citizens, a lot of their citizens retain or still have have um, water softening so you know we figure that even if we did ion that we would that citizens who already have softeners probably would keep them as you say use less salt it's possible that that people coming in may choose not in new new construction they may choose not to install softeners now almost everybody does so um, I think it'll give people a little bit more choice <clears throat> <clears throat> the other thing that we noticed as we, we toured the various plants and so forth that their wastewater treatment plants were kind of close to the water plant. So in terms of, of their discharge, they didn't have to go a long way. And, and, uh, and, and most of the places unless that I saw, unless they, they did major demolition, it, it didn't look like there were, there were a lot of obstacles to reaching their, their wastewater plant, whereas ours, we know where ours is, our water treatment plant is, and then to get it to, the, to where we need to go and some of the hurdles that we, we might have to, you know, especially going through the gland and so forth, uh, is, you know. It gives us an incentive to do a good job. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. right. So, good question. Yeah, magnesium zinc, does that produce the sludge that you have to get rid of? Mm. Uh, I mean, iron, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, yes. Um, what we will do there is, um, you know, settle, uh, plate frame press that sludge and then that should really be landfilled. There's really no practical use for that. But that's a very small quantity. When we toured Tate Monroe, um, they, they have an iron manganese removal plant, and they roll off their dumpster once a year. Hmm. Okay. My other question is, this potable water, potable water is that going to taste like bottled water? Um, yeah, that's it's such a, I guess, tastes are so individual. I, it's, if we soften your water, um, I think it'd be hard to discern the difference at this, it, you're gonna, um, 
not have that much difference because you retain still some hardness. So I don't, I don't think there's going to be much taste. The example I'll give you is that, uh, and I use the Tate Monroe, they have two water treatment plants. One they soften with nanofiltration, one they soften with ion exchange. One plant is about five years old, the other plant is a little over 40 years old. And so we did quite a few experiments because some of the customers would be in one zone, another zone, and some would be mixed. And so when we were doing the piloting, as long as we kept the pH the same, and you know, I think for the most part we're going to keep it a little bit elevated, but it should not change. We really couldn't tell the difference between one type of softened water or another. Because right now I drink only the tap water, and I'm just using Yeah, and I, I don't think you would ha change, have any difference in the taste of your water. But I suppose the pellets are the least chemical use in terms of as in terms of actually in the water, is that right? Yeah, the only chemicals that we'll use are a pH adjusting compound, which we were planning to do anyway prior to the iron and manganese step, because by slightly elevating the pH, you, you have an ambient pH of about 7.2. If we can elevate that just very slightly to about 7.6, you'll get complete manganese removal. Iron is usually not a problem. It's usually the manganese that yeah. causes the black stains. So if we can slightly elevate. So we were planning to use sodium hydroxide anyway. With pellet softening, we'll just have a slightly bigger chemical system and we'll put slightly, well, we'll put more in there. And so then that's where you add a little bit of sodium, but you get the pH up to a point and then we'll bring the pH back down, but that's <laughs> usually uh, you know, bubbling carbon dioxide in there, which doesn't really uh, carry over. It just actually uh, reacts with you know, with the uh, with the uh, materials in the water. So uh, the only uh, additional chemical that you'll see in your water will be a little bit uh, uh, caustic or sodium hydroxide, and then chlorine that you put in right now. Anyway. Sam, does the does the magne or the manganese and iron does that precipitate out together? I mean, it's so the sludge or whatever is left after that. I mean, that's yes. That that'll be at the bottom of the retention basin. It will periodically withdraw <coughs> that and then press it, and then you know it'll be hauled off to the landfill and so forth. It's not worth lots of money or anything. Uh, no, um, it's uh, kind of this black sludge. Um, and the plate and frame, you usually put some sort of um, diatomaceous earth or some sort of pre-coating on it, so uh, it's white on either side. So it looks like a huge Oreo, truthfully, a reverse <laughs> Oreo. So these big plates that fall out, and then there's usually a roll-off that uh, you then put it in a dumpster. Yes. So um, the pellet softening does not take out magnesium. That's correct. So then the hardness that remains is that mostly magnesium and magnesium carbonate. I mean, I noticed you have it listed as calcium carbonate, but wouldn't it be magnesium well, carbonate? Uh, for instance, your ambient water has a mag magnesium. I have to make sure. I would, uh, magnesium, between yeah. magnesium and manganese, it drives you right. nuts here right. to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, magnesium, your ambient level is about 40 milligrams per liter, but expressed as CaCO3, it's more like 120. But why are you expressing it as calcium carbonate if it's That magnesium? is the industry standard. Oh, and, that's and, how they do it? Um, you know, it's been 30 years since I went through school, and I can't remember exactly why they do it. Um, <laughs> I, I guess maybe it's put on a standard, because there's a, evidently, hardness through various countries, the United States, Germany, Britain, all of them do it on a different basis. And so here in the United States, the convention is, regardless of carbonate or non-carbonate, you always convert it over to CaCO3. So it's a conversion? Yes. Okay. And 
in our case, it's about a four to one for uh, magnesium. So I think that when we break down, say, an average hardness of about 450 milligrams at CaCO3 for Yellow Springs groundwater, 150 of that is yeah, magnesium-based as CaCO3. So right off the bat, you're right in the middle of that 120 to 150 range that's traditionally softened water for municipalities. But, but once it is softened with the pellets, then uh, a large part of the hardness is going to be the magnesium. Yes. Yeah. If we look at that range where we said 180 to 223, then right off the bat, 150 of that is magnesium-based, so it's about 30 you know, to 83 is really calcium-based. Um, and the other question I had is the sand that gets produced as uh, the waste that has the calcium, it's benign, essentially? Yes. Yeah, it, it, it appears much like regular sand. It's just a very fine sand. <laughs> well, actually, that's what I wanted to clarify. I mean, this sand could be used at a pl on a playground or something like that, or yeah, I don't even I don't see why it couldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't. Yeah, I, you with know, the lime on it though. Yeah, maybe, maybe I like should. Uh, maybe I should really say it. it's better if we just categorize it as construction, agricultural, or roadway maintenance during inclement weather. I think those would probably be best. It's probably not good to have an indirect contact with, with the public. Okay. One, one of my neighbors is very concerned about looking at ion based softening, about how much magnesium it removes. And I think his contention was that a certain amount of magnesium has a beneficial long term effect on health. Is that correct? Uh, you know, I'm not familiar with that. Um, what does it do with the heart? Yes, it's magnesium. Yep. So the certain amount of magnesium, I don't know if such a thing is too much of a good thing, but he was very concerned that if we went to ion bay softening, we remove almost all the magnesium and at a certain level it was desirable. Yeah, and um, you know, that's why those ranges are typically used uh, so that you have a, a water that's in good balance, and that's why that 120 to 180 range. Uh, you know, maybe 90% of municipalities do it within that range, and so by bypassing third, 20 to 30 percent of the flow, you're retaining some of that natural hardness. Um, related to the sand, and maybe Joe, this is a question for you too. Have you guys thought at all about where we would store it? Does that come up yet? Johnny's nodding. Much like they do it. Oh. It would be probably stored out at the farm because more likely it would be myself and my crew and Jason mm -hmm. uh, using it. Okay. And place of gravel for ditches and water line bedding and all that. And you guys have enough room? Okay. I mean, Sam, I guess maybe one question that you could answer would be the quantities of sand that are actually going to be produced as a byproduct because you don't really change the sand out that often, correct? You know, they, uh, the, the information that we had that's applicable to the size of facility for Yellow Springs, I thought the blowdown which is removal of sand from the treatment stream was about one and a half cubic feet per six hour period. So if you generate the water that you need over a 12 hour period, um, what does it take, 27 cubic feet to make a cubic yard? So, um, I, you know, I haven't really done the quantity I exact. But it's not gonna be a huge <coughs> quantity. Um, no, it's not like a 20 cubic yard dumpster a day right. uh, from like lime softening. And so uh, conceivably, if my understanding is correct, for the number of digs that we have and the other construction that we do, we, we would probably use most of that in that type of thing. Johnny, would you agree? I, I would agree with that. I mean, if we had a large quantity, I mean, we're getting ready to do a 
waterfront right until we could have cut some of the cost out mm -hmm. by using our own sand to bed or our own piping that we're getting ready to pay to have done. I think another aspect of it is it's um, you know it's inert and it can be stockpiled really right. in a variety of places. It's not like your wastewater sludge, which you, you can't leave out. Lime sludge, you really have so much of it, you, you can't do it. And the other storage aspect of lime sludge, many times lagoons, but I, again, you're eventually <coughs> going to have to clean out a, a huge amount of material. The other question I have is. Um, I mean, we and it was addressed a little bit with Kent's question, but trying to get a better idea of what this reduction uh, in hardness is actually going to equate to. So, you know, I understand we talked about it means that residential water softeners have to work uh, not as hard, but what effectively are we going to see? I mean, what's the real difference in terms of going from 450 to 225 or whatever. It would really be the rate of scaling <coughs> so that uh, if you effectively reduce the rate of scaling by two, you should get a life that, that, that um, you know, is extended out, maybe not twice as long, but longer for all of your equipment, uh, meters, mm -hmm. valves, from a homeowner standpoint, even the valves for your uh, you know your toilets, your spigots, that sort of thing. Uh, so you should get a longer life. Water heaters are the biggest thing that scale up, and so it's hard to really say that if you reduce this, the the uh, hardness of the water by half, you're going to get twice the length. But you intuitively should get a much longer life that would approach something on, on that order. So right. it's really deferred maintenance, longer life because of, because okay. of it. Well, one of the things we get, Brian, when we had a session earlier with some of our institutional and industrial customers, they're probably going to still have to, in other words, the brewery, uh, people who use our water and their boilers and so on, they're probably still going to have to precondition the water to keep mm -hmm. their equipment in good shape. Right? But I, I think their operating costs will be yeah, much less right. because yeah. half of their hardness right. that they're used to removing is already removed for them. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I think it directly impacts their bottom line that they have to spend less money yeah. on chemicals or whatever process they use. Yeah, it's pretty stunning how much they were spending. Take what we think is perfectly good water and, and prepare it for their end use. Right. I think the brewery will obviously have to continue. I mean, theirs is more about they need everything mm -hmm. filtered out of it. Mm -hmm. um, Are the scaling characteristics the same for both? Um, in terms of adhering and all this kind of thing, or would be the same. I think in the, in the periodic table, they're in the same. Room. My right. inclination is that the magnesium was softer, but I can't tell you the basis of that other than maybe a distant memory from decades ago in a lecture. <laughs> I. <clears throat> the answer to that. <coughs> I'd like to thank you for this. has been very informative. <coughs> I'd like to encourage you to pursue the idea of softening. You know, at my age, I'm creating those 40 pound bags of salt down the road. It gets harder. We just need to find you a new house, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> In Yellow Springs. <laughs> but. I'll, I'll bet you can direct me to an architect. <laughs> well, no, you just need, we just need to get, to get all the, all of our elders in single yeah. floor houses. I can't believe you're going up and down s basement steps. Wow. As a kid, I remember doing that. For six years, it was my responsibility. I remember one time when the, uh, you had the little thing ripped off all the way down. <laughs> the stairs, so. <laughs> that's what yes it's a good term <laughs> uh, Sam I, I guess this is it's a general question um, the sooner that we as a council make a decision on pursuing the softening approach you folks can then start 
putting your your pieces together better for uh, the get, treatment plant layout. Yeah, yes. and layout and so forth. And what we would like to do is we're going to work with manufacturers, if that's what you so choose, mm -hmm. to really refine that range. So we will do pilot testing. We'll do some what we call jar testing to make sure that we can replicate those results in laboratory type fashion before we you know, go into the full scale. Do we have a, a plan? Uh, have you been thinking about when to make the decision? Uh, <laughs> put it this way, you know, I, I'm kind of like Karen, you know, for, for such an, to me, an important decision uh, and, and, and I look out in the audience and, you know, I don't see anyone. So uh, I'm sure uh, you, can. you know, <laughs> well, it, you count, but, <laughs> but, but, know. you know, um, that, y y yeah, I did. So, so that kind of tells me that uh, the citizens were confident with the group that we put together to go out and look at these processes and and I think the number of places that we went to uh, you know we went as far as uh, well into what past Richmond Indiana and, and oh, look no. oh, Indianapolis uh, you, well, right past yeah. in Indianapolis and, and we we looked at f uh, five plants I think it was uh, then we went as far as far as Jackson County to actually see the, the, the pellet saw, and then we made an additional trip to the St. Henry, uh, New Bremen area to, to, to look at theirs. And uh, one of the things that we really found out is that, you know, they don't want a whole lot of sodium mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, in the water and so forth. And, and although we're not getting, we're, our softening is not down at the 120 range, we're, we're in an area that uh, I may not be able to benefit a lot from it, but folks in the future, uh, 50 years down the road and so, are gonna benefit tremendously from the softening process. And, and I feel that, you know, I know we're missing one council member, but, uh, I'm ready to, to say let's move forward uh, yeah, I, with the softening. That's that's just Jerry talking about. Yeah, it. Jerry, yeah. I did meet with um, Lori before she left and went over the presentation with her and explained um, essentially what uh, Sam has presented tonight. Um, she did tell me that she was going to email Karen before she left, and apparently she she neglected to do that. But she was in favor of the pellet softening, um, so. Yeah, yeah. There's no uh, quick, cheap add on that'll take to make easy on my choice. <coughs> uh, you know, not with this technology, it would have to be another one. Uh, I think it's, we need to also mention not only is this the best reusable source, but it's also actually the cheapest source because the two of the other options, we have to get a pipe from one plant to the other plant. Right. And that's going to, the, the amount of cost is going to be tremendous. Right, because the, so, the closest manhole is at Spillin' and Hyde. Correct. Mm -hmm. So actually, the staff and everybody that's worked on this, we didn't even take that into consideration. Mm -hmm. We all was just, the pellets were the best, and then it come to find out that it's going to be the cheapest in the long run. Well, and I assume, Sam, on your, your price, uh, when you were talking about the waste of the two, um, uh, of the two ion softenings, that that didn't include the fact that we were going to have. That was just the. Oh, it's just the equipment cost equipment. for the right. software. So, so right. it wasn't remember, the capital cost we were going to have yeah. to invest. We did right. look at a pump station cost, and for that pipeline and pump station, it was around two hundred and forty thousand dollars to be able to. Uh, uh, transfer that liquid waste, whether it be nanofiltration or ion exchange. So you'd need a submersible pump station and then a force main to get it to your collection system. But those weren't included in the equipment costs. That's why I wanted to 
it would really skew some of those. I wanted to look just at the equipment costs themselves. Mm -hmm. But there are other add-ons that, that would be required. <coughs> just like lime softening, you would probably need some sort of uh, sludge dewatering system too that could be another quarter of a million dollars in addition to that $800,000. So um, by far, the pellet softening from an equipment standpoint is very um, cost effective. And we also went with the highest cost where we used stainless steel. So it was really the top of the line pellet softening compared very favorably with the rest of the equipment. I think we should make the decision at a, at a regular meeting rather than at a special meeting. Um, but I, you know, I think we can make it sooner than later. I'm, I'm wondering is, could you, I mean, Judy, I'd like to maybe if we, did you send this to Judy or, yeah, you yes. did send this to yeah. us. Yeah, we are. Is, there a, is there a way for, for, what are you all thinking? I mean, I, Jerry and I have already said that we prefer the pellet. Lori, are, is that what you? Yes, um, yeah. I would. I think that it, um, it's a good medium step. It doesn't take all the right. hardness off, mm -hmm. which a lot of people, like, including me, yeah, like. like some. Uh, it doesn't add a lot of sodium. Mm -hmm. it, the cost is good. The the waste is good. Um, and and I do think that given that <coughs> we don't have much many citizens here, if we say it looks like that's going to be our decision, then at least. Probably that will get in the paper, and if there are people who disagree or yeah, agree, we'll they probably will come. come. Are you feeling how? What are you feeling? Yeah, if we're going to soften, I think pellet softening looks the best. <clears throat> I will say the one thing that would help me make a decision is if there's some kind of way that studies that have quantified again this sort of if you reduce you know hardness by half what that really translates to in terms of just this maintenance benefit. I'd, I'd like to know how to quantify that a little bit more. What are we, you, what are we really getting for that investment? Um, so and that's, you know, not, I don't want a lot of extra work to go in if that information's not already out there. So but. your question is, does it, if we reduce the hardness by half, does that reduce the scaling by a third? Is that I guess just so that we can, you know, really quantify like right. why it's worth investing Six hundred thousand dollars or whatever in this solution. If we could do a literature search and then summarize those results, someone has had to do a cost-benefit analysis sure. on that order of magnitude level. Yeah. And when you think about all the variables, you know, you've got your industry, you've got your residential makeup, and, and all the other aspects. So I think it it may be somewhat difficult to quantify but we will look to see if there is some way to say yeah this is how some planner or some you know logistical economist had figured out this this aspect I think that'd be nice to have yeah, yeah. And, and then if you could also um, could, could you maybe um, add a few a few more details about pellet softening to the presentation and just so that that citizens since since you know, council, we have five council members that are at this point favoring that so that they could have a little bit more information and, well, we and could, maybe even highlight it in, in the presentation to say this is. I mean, we could do, we are intending to document the whole planning purpose, uh, uh, purpose, process. the process, thank you, in a technical memorandum. So we were going to write up, uh, because pellet softening was the selected alternative, some very specific aspects about it, so we could provide you with that write-up that really describes. I would like, and then we could have that. We could link that on the on the website. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd like to give uh, Joe, Brad, and Johnny uh, an opportunity for their input and, and how they feel about the softening and, and options and things. Because you guys went to all of the plants. I I didn't get to go to all of them, but I know you guys went to all of them. And I did go to the Jackson County one, which is the pellet softening, and you all seem to favor that one yeah, quite a bit. So could you say you why? To, you want to look to them? And, and should we say why our other um, plant operator is uh, not here? Yeah. Richard, Richard yeah. Stockton is a, a new father for the second time. He had a little boy, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, from an operational standpoint, yes, we agree with the pellet softening, definitely. Um, we like that whole process. The, the waste process is very clean, environmentally friendly. I think that was a huge issue, especially even with EPA. Um, and we haven't even 
had a meeting with them yet. So, you know, they're really looking at total dissolved solids in the waste stream. And ion exchange would, ion exchange would produce more of that. Um, but yes, I think we're in all in agreement. And I think, too, our choices are, in some ways, the least expensive. We're not looking at the Cadillac version of, the, of, of a new treatment plant. Um, we want something that we're proud of, but these technologies are very affordable, we think, as, as we toured these different plants. So I think that's important for the, the whole project cost, too. And, um, and I think that, that maybe need, that'll probably be summed up as a total price. Correct. When, because we've looked at filtration, <coughs> the, the iron, and iron and manganese removal process, and what kind of filters that we desire as operators. Um, we like the conventional, the more open type filters, and come to find out those aren't the most expensive, you know. They're more on the less expensive side. So um, we really want what works, you know, what's been proven. And I think this pellet, <coughs> pellet type softening and also the open conventional filters is the direction we really want to go. And if Brad wants to say something or add to that. Okay. Uh, could you can to say that because the sludge and other material is less toxic, you're not dealing with acid, is there a slight advantage in terms of employee safety? Uh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. And we're looking at that also with, with chlorine gas and sodium hypochlorite. Yep. Um, the weak acid, we know that it takes a huge amount of storage uh, for a month's supply, what EPA would require, perhaps, to store this weak acid, you know, and it is an acid, like you're, you're saying. So um, we're looking at, yeah, the safety aspect is huge, too. Could you speak to the, the ease of operation um, for, for the pellet softening? Because I think that was an issue for you as well. Is yeah, that, especially. How difficult the softening system would be to operate. Especially, yes, when you compare it to lime softening. There's, there's a lot of sludge you deal with with lime softening. Starting and stopping a plant, a small plant, would be very difficult. Um, this pellet softening, um, basically you add sand, there's a conveyor, we, we saw that, um, and then it gets disposed in a bin that could be picked up very easily with a bobcat or mm -hmm. front loader. Um, yeah, the, the whole process uh, feels good, really. <laughs> okay. So. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Sure. Johnny, did you want to say anything? No. I guess the only thing that I would ask, if Sam could get us the quantity of discharge of the sand, um, because we can also figure that into the, the cost of gravel that we won't have to purchase. Mm -hmm. So the amount of sand that's produced versus the amount of gravel that we have to purchase for the ditches and bedding of the pipe. Uh, my very capable assistant village <laughs> manager, while we were sitting here, did a quick calculation based on the, the one and a half cubic foot, and it would take 90 days to fill a 20 yard dumpster, according to him. <laughs> so it, it would save us quite a bit, because mm -hmm. I mean, you're saying 90 days, so you'd have 80 cubic yards, yard, that's 10 dump trucks. So that's a, that's a lot of savings. We would probably use digs. half of that just in the winter. Wow, mm -hmm. that's that's great. For street maintenance, for water. Yeah, I don't think we use it for street maintenance because I we don't yeah, we don't I use sand it, because of goes going in the storm sewers, yeah. Drains. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Although we it's might be able to sell it to somebody. I mean, there might be other communities right. that yeah, use sand exactly. that we could sell it to. Because I would guess that that lime adhered to it would probably be good for the for the snow also for the ice too. It might. We could, we could be like the city of Milwaukee. We yeah, don't find would find sewage sludge and so. Would it be safe? <laughs> safe to say from they a do. from a uh, council yeah. standpoint, our 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 next meeting is uh, six, April April six. April yeah. six. Um, it's probably going to take you a little bit of time to to get that information together, but uh, we should be able to make a decision by the second second meeting in April or uh, should we say April the 6th because uh, if councils feel I mean from what I'm hearing from council you're all feeling pretty comfortable 
So I'm sure that Diane is going to be getting it in the paper yeah. um, probably next week because it's and so, I mean, that's two weeks for folks to respond. Okay. Sam, yeah. the information, the additional information you were going to put together, how long do you think that will take? Um, so we could have until the end of next week, we could get you the synopsis. And it could be posted on the website then for. So that, and that mm -hmm. still gives us time. That yeah. still gives yeah. it on, because we've got that extra. Over a week. Yeah, because yeah, I, you know, yeah. you know, right. we, we've got a schedule and so forth, and we're not in disagreement, so. Uh, and, and it will yeah, definitely so help uh, uh, our, our contractor uh, uh, move forward. So, you know, uh, from come from the council standpoint, you know, I just feel we should be prepared to make a decision at the April six. Yeah, and, and if you remember, we didn't have a lot on our agenda for April six right, at this point. Right. So I think it would be it would be preferable to try to get it on the agenda for that meeting. Right. And we'll include whatever Sam sends. I mean, you know, as soon as we get it, even this right now, we can get this linked somewhere on the website, and Maybe then perhaps a clean copy of that. Yeah, and yeah, then right. um, whatever Sam sends, we can add, and then also put it in the packet. So mm -hmm. people will have plenty of information to, to consider. The electronic version now is on your computer. I copied over the PowerPoint. Right um, there, during one of our work sessions, Sam, you provided us with a. Uh, that it's yes. called softening comparison. This yeah, and we, we've all okay. written on ours. Yeah, yeah. can you send us a clean you. copy of that? Um, that would be helpful. You want that to be incorporated into that write up? That would be yes. Yeah, right. That would be great because right. then it'll be right there and we can put it on the website as a document. Yeah, all of those handouts and deliverables we were planning to collect into a technical memorandum, and that would then summarize our entire planning effort to that point. That that was really part of our scope. Okay. And so, um, and so it's my understanding then that you will decide on this in early April. And so, I, I think our planning period ended about early April. So we'll just push that schedule back to maybe the end of April, and then we'll complete that planning phase. Because we, we still have some investigation and some surveying to do as part of the planning period. And so, um, if um, if we want to do that, then I'll just extend out the schedule. So, so our next deliverable, we'll plan to put together some color softening detail uh, and incorporate them at the table. That, uh, that would be great. All right. Very good. Yeah, and I want I want to thank Sam and his group because uh, uh, we we had two carloads of citizens here as we went around and. As we went to the various plants and so forth, you could kind of see the look in the operators' faces and so forth to say, you know, uh, these folks must really be serious to, to send this big group to, uh, to look at it. And, uh, and I and I took hundreds of, of pictures. Yeah, I and, think maybe uh, we can get some of those pictures yeah, well, into into. Yeah, and, and I know John. Uh, oh, I took them. Like, and, they're still and, on my but, phone. Uh, I look know, at them it, every day. It, 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 it was an interesting and a, and a learning process, and uh, just like Joe, uh, the operators like to talk about their their plans, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, I mean. Uh, they enjoyed it, and I think we enjoyed it, and we, we learned quite a bit, which kind of makes it easy to uh, come up with a decision in terms of uh, uh, where we think we should be going and so forth. And uh, and believe me, we were we, we were like like little mice all over, the, <laughs> and, 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 and seriously looking and asking questions on the on the various processes and so mm -hmm. forth. And uh, the pellet, you know, rose to the top. So it was a great process. Yeah, I appreciate everyone who yeah. went to council members and staff. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, Ken. We miss you. Which we know. Was <laughs> <laughs> you know. Jerry was the motivating force behind your remodel. This is a gorgeous. Uh, yeah. Thanks. I aged a little bit, not knowing what it's going to look like, but it, it it came out not too fancy, but nice, it, nice and appealing. And the audio's the the audio's nice. The audio's working much better than before. So, um, 
I actually feel like, I don't know, there's something, I feel like we're actually closer to people because we don't have that big, yeah. big yeah. Depth, yeah. In, depth in the table, so. Well, thanks, Kent. Any other questions, issues from people here? Well, thank you. I, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And thank you to the crews and to everybody for, and give Richard our best. Yep. Yeah.